All right. Hey, everyone. This is the SIG off meeting for March 2nd, 2022. Uh, we have a pretty light agenda today, so we can get started. Um, so the first one, let's see, I think Anish, you're on the call with me. So this was a conversation that Anish, myself, Rita, and some others were having yesterday. And why to bring it up again to this larger group just to confirm. Uh, so uh, like two plus years ago now, we had talked about um, the envelope encryption that's used by KMS and the fact that it uses AES-CDC and it really shouldn't, it probably should use AES-GCM. Um, and I had made a PR to start the migration away from the old to the new, but we sort of paused that work because we're like, yeah, we're going to change the storage format. Maybe let's have like a better storage format altogether. And so this crazy prefixing soup we got going on. Uh, but we never did really revisit that. Um, as part of the KMS improvement efforts, uh, we've been discussing, um, you know, building a new format. And the overall question is, um, I think we would like to encode within that format what encryption is being used, just so it's clear and explicit how the system was set up. But we did not want to expose any configuration. Instead, we would use AES GCM, and that would just be how the system works. And we could expand it with configuration and other things later, if truly necessary. Um, folks think that is a reasonable option, or is there some real need around exposing this as configuration? Uh, I don't think so. I, I think what, what we could do, I'm trying to remember since it was so long ago, but um, yeah, it would be like, so it would be just nice to um, have a, so we have we have the prefix right now. If we can just turn that into like a proto, with even if it was just like a name field for now or something, um, th that is like equal to what the current prefix is. That would allow us to make changes more easily in the future. Um, I don't even know if. So I guess we have to decide whether it is easier to do two things at once or whether it's kind of the same amount of work. And if it's the same amount of work, then we can just, we don't really need to bundle these things up either. Um, yeah, so yes, we were, for the storage format, we are gonna pursue as just, at least as a starting point, something based on our, our proto machinery that exists today. Uh, so it'll, it'll have that flexibility. Um, uh, we were kind of, um, we're kind of looking at this from the, the viewpoint of like a V2 alpha one, that way we, we, we can try to solve all the problems that are sort of apparent to us in whatever way makes the most sense. And then kind of come back to, should we improve like v1 beta 1 grpc api or or whatever or like leave it alone kind of like it's it's not the the act of migrating from like a storage format change for kms versus just migrating to a different kms is basically exactly the same right you you have to do the storage migration dance basically um so but yeah, so I, right now we're thinking about this all as um, just a large effort to just basically fix the problems within KMS. Um, but I, from here, for this particular thing, I just wanted to make sure that there wasn't some actual use case where AES CBC was preferred and someone would actually ask for that as a choice. Um, Not for the deck encryption. Yeah. Uh, or not encryption of the deck, deck encrypting the data. The deck being used to encrypt data. Right. 
Um, yeah, okay. Uh, as an aside, I know it's been many, many years. Does anybody know why we picked ASCBC? Like, it's not exactly clear to me. I could do some archaeology and try to figure it out, but I'm just, this just twist doesn't make any sense because it's, un it's unauthenticated and like slower than GCM. And because we only use it once per, like we make I, these. Yeah, I don't think we just, I, I think we just chose ASCBC just as the default algorithm for deck encryption. And then that just kind of was inherited by um, for the data encryption as well. Right. Which I know we made a conscious decision for CBC on the encryption of the DEX, um, but I'm not sure we made a conscious decision for deck encrypting data. Sorry, sorry, it's fine. Uh, okay. uh, does anyone else have anything on this? I can well, so I would just say, um, don't, yeah, I, I, I don't want to like overcomplicate it if we can make the incremental progress, um, kind of like we're doing for the um, CA search stuff. So this seems like incremental progress. We're going to have to have like a perfect vision for the future um, before we get started. So, um, yeah, no, I mean, yeah. Making some decent progress because, like, Anish, myself, Rita, and a few other folks meet every week, just kind of talk and just kind of force <laughs> just the meeting forces us to think about this and actually try to do something instead of hand waving it. So, that that's that's helpful. Um, so but yeah, I think we're not too far off from having some something to bring back to this group and get feedback and see what folks think. Yeah, I'm, I'm hoping we, we can do something in next release of 125, right? Yeah. It's all kind of blurred together. Um, okay. Yeah, cool. Uh, uh, to hear you have a comment about making a cat. Uh, he's not able to make this meeting. But uh, you just wanted to give an update that that should be ready by the next SIGOTH meeting. Okay, I, I, I missed the last SIGOTH meeting. Did by any chance was revocation brought up? I think I, no. I saw you, Mike, about I would like a webhook. Like I would like to be able to plumb this data through a network request, which is I think totally reasonable. Uh, I, I, I would also like to be able to plumb <laughs> the CRL while I'm at it. Uh, I guess that isn't that um, up to the CA implementation. Like if the CA sir has a CRL list, I maybe I, I guess um, I guess that's fair if if that all sort of plums through correctly. I hadn't really thought about it like that. Um, Uh, Mike, is there a pre-cap doc? Uh, it's it's just a sub uh, this, this cap. Yeah, I'm just seeing it. Okay, great, awesome. Thanks. Yeah, yeah it is basically. Uh, I would like to also have trust distribution as part of CSR API, and that in itself is a valuable problem to solve that we've kind of hand waved by saying that it's not CSR's responsibility. Um, to do that, so it'd be kind of nice. Okay, um, I'm looking forward to that. Uh, okay, Mike, I, I saw that you added something about RBAC conditions, like fractions of seconds before <laughs> the meeting. Uh, I haven't exactly had time to look at yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. So this was just. Um, I just wanted to bring this up for discussion. Like, I don't have a cap. I, I literally did this in like an hour yesterday and an hour today to just like play with this idea. Um, but yeah, if you can you reload that page because I, I fixed the tabs to spaces thing for that that RBAC example. Um, the the basic idea here is that there's a, RBAC is great, but there's a lot of things you can't do with RBAC. 
right? Like, and there's a lot of use cases that I've I've seen that I don't want to call anyone out and you know any one project out or anything at this point, but um, where they'll just give like something like node status patch to every daemon that runs on every node. And sometimes it's a lot more than that, like pod update or node update, like node uh, patch um, or no, or pod delete, right? And the, the agents typically only need access to like the node object that they run on or a shadow object like the CSI object, but not one injury, right? And so I like I want to be able to express, okay, I want the service account to only modify itself or the the stuff the node that it runs on or some shadow CRD of the the node that it runs on um, or or something like that. And so I started to kind of explore this idea of what if we could add conditions to our back? And what if we could also integrate like uh, authentication user info into that um, and, and also request request attributes. So this example is just really simple. We don't have a lot of operators, but just to kind of demonstrate the idea, like what if you could have, you know, the, the user extra info be a comparison against something on the request like the name. So this way with this example, uh, YAML here, like I can restrict, say, say this cluster role was, you know, bound to a service account. And in the service account, again, it's, it's also in this, this branch, uh, I, I added extra info of the, the node name that the pod is bound to. So this way you can see, okay, if it, again, this condition is dependent on there being a node name in the, in the user extra info, but that would allow a service account to only modify or patch the node that it runs on. And this, so this kind of adds a back to our back, but I, I, I haven't compiled this. I haven't like tested this. This is more just like a, an example that I just wanted to try and see if I could play around with um, in the last like 12 hours. So I, I, I kind of wanted to get any early feedback and see if people think like this is something, like is this a need that we have? Because I, I feel like it is. I feel like I see this problem all the time and there's not a great answer to it, but I, I'd love to hear yeah feedback or something from anyone else. Personally, haven't had enough time since I read this to actually make. Uh, uh, neither have I. Sure. David, are you chatting? Talking? I can't hear you. Yeah. Uh, I I don't think I've had enough time either. Um, I sure. I checked the agenda before lunch, and I don't think this was on it. And I came back after lunch, and and here it is. Um, mm -hmm. I have I have some very raw thoughts, but like nothing I wouldn't want to be able to to think about and come back with more, perhaps sure. or, or different ones. But um, you know, one thought that occurs to me is if we want such a different kind of of authorizer, um, why marry it to to uh, our back, right? Like this is notionally different. Um, would it actually even be simpler to do as a as a new kind of authorizer? Um, other thoughts would be things like um, a not equals comparison is is something that worries me um, because you know in the early days of RBAC there were a lot of requests for for that feature or star minus um, as as something they wanted and then we added more resources and if we had had that. Um, they would have broken. Um, so that worries me a little bit too. Um, those are just like very raw, like looking at it for the two minutes here. That's what pops into my head. Sam, your hands up if you want to go. I see you're unmuted, but I don't hear anything. Can you hear me now? Uh, maybe. I heard, can you hear me now? But it cut off very quickly, which indicates that it stopped working. 
I think Tim's regret for using Linux has probably reached like a very high right now. <laughs> Ooh, now he's got plants in this background. I went from a piano, like a guitar to a piano and now there's cool plants. Uh, I guess while we're waiting for Tim, I also do have another sort of mechanical question of what you would expect this to do on creates. Uh, I often see cases where people want, uh, if they want control by a particular name, they almost always also want control uh, on creates. Yeah. And that information is not available to the authorizer. Um, I was going to make a quick comment, David. I have not actually validated this, but Jordan has told me that if you do uh, the new server side apply fanciness, the name is available on create somehow. Yes, um, semantics of apply are di different than create or update, right? Apply is I want to coexist with what other people think other fields in this controller should be or yes. in this object should be. Uh, and that's not always appropriate for the objectives of, of what you're trying to do. That's fair. Uh, but could you, I guess I don't know this. I haven't really tried any of this. Could you use apply to then create the object you want and then do update to force it into the state that you want it in? Thus, sort of. Can't say as I've I've done it or tried to. Okay. Jim, is your audio working? Still not. Okay. David, what do you see as the downsides of trying to explicitly say this isn't supported on create? Um, I, again, this is like, I looked at it for just a couple minutes because that was the time that I yeah, had. Yeah, I'm asking you to um, project other people's thoughts, but. <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, so not having this power on create, I, I would say that this looks as though it is most likely going to be used for someone can control this particular instance of this particular thing, but I don't want to enumerate every single one of them independently. And I would expect that create would be an important part of, of the full use case, but I, I, I didn't even click to see if there was a full use case listed in the, the diff. Yeah, there's no use case. This is mostly just, I, hadn't, I haven't even had time to really write this up. I can, I can put something together for next time, but mostly just kind of wanted to see if, I, I know that this has been a problem of discussing it with some folks and kind of wanted to see if there was any yeah, what, what the thinking was. So this is helpful. I, I guess I would ask, um, uh, so this, I, I believe what you're saying there is this is trying to key off something from extra. Um, as far as I know, there's no built-in thing that does extra other than token webhook. Uh, so presumably, if you're willing to run a token webhook, you could also run a... Uh, Service account authenticator. Service account token authenticator. Oh, yeah. Right, service right. account does extra. Yeah, that's right. Service account does extra for the bound fanciness stuff. Uh, but yeah, other than that, though, like for a for for humanish actors, uh, I guess maybe this is maybe this is less relevant to humanish actors. Uh, it's usually a token log hook. Uh, I, I guess the, my my question is sort of still the same. You could use a webhook authorizer to express this that you may. No, not for reads. Why not? Why not? Oh, well, webhook authorizer. Sorry, I thought you said webhook admission. Yes, webhook authorizer. Yes. Yeah. But that's, that's, uh, I think that the, my initial thinking has been like, our back for better, for worse, is what everyone thinks of when they think of, it's not just think of, but use for Kubernetes authorization. So requiring a webhook authorizer is a pretty heavy lift for a lot of, a lot of, uh, a lot of just users. And then also how do you, ex you have to have a policy language or a CRD type to, to express that in some way. And, and for think, thinking of all the Helm charts for, for agents, they, they just have an RBAC policy. And so being able to extend that in some way, there's a lot of value there. Yeah, my, my view on a like potential killer app is the, uh, the thing that I think Tim was trying to say in number two, the node scope demon sets, which is like, 
there's all these agents running around that want to run something on a node and want to update something on a node. And the way you do that today is you give yourself permission to update all nodes. And if we had something like this and you also plumbed through the node name into extra, um, then you could fairly easily write a policy that says as long as node equals node, you're allowed to do it. I don't know if Micah already called that out before I joined. Yeah. No, so uh, in thinking about that, though, would you also want to do something like what the node authorizer does today, where you're actually restricting which fields that actor can touch on a shared resource? Potentially. And I think there's like avenues where if this really caught on and people were like, oh, I, now I want to be able to mess with secrets that are bound to this node, you could, you know, populate resource, you could populate the available conditions on a resource to include like contents of the node graph. I, I think that's, I don't know, maybe kind of crazy, but. What? Yeah, it, it's very early for all of us looking at this, uh, but I think I would say that that would require a different sort of implementation because you would need to have both an authorizer and an admission plugin. And you would some, and you may need to take into account the results of one in the other, right? But that's the way node admission works today, because that's the only point in time at which you actually have access to the resource itself. Hey, and I, I don't know that. I think the goal is not to solve every case. Probably with this, I think it's just to try to make some things better, which certain things are are not great. Like I think there's just big avenues. I see big avenues for lots of daemons to run amok with too many permissions that are cluster scoped and easily like cross node boundaries. What about for like a pod bound object? Does this actually solve the problem? I mean, yeah, right. if, the, if the object is the same name as the pod or something. How would the, in our or, rule, how do you express that? Uh, like, like how would a pod be able to modify it? Uh, like a daemon, like, so for cubelets reading secrets, how mm -hmm. do you express that here? Is that possible? Oh yeah. Like that, I, no, I'm not saying it would have, no. So th like that, that wouldn't have the full node graph. So that wouldn't, it would be mostly request based. So what's in the request, um, and what's in the identity of the caller. So. And by the request, I mean like the things that are accessible to the authorizer. So, you know, API schema or API, excuse me, API version, resource type, uh, you know, object name, if, if that's there, verb. Um, yes, I think what you're saying though is th this does not have the capabilities of like the node authorizer plus node admission. Right. Right? Th those right. things, of course, both a very specific uh, authorization level semantic in the graph, yeah. and they yes. further extend that with updates to be very specific on objects uh, with the admission bit. Um, I was going to take a second and just try to read what Tim wrote in chat, uh, which was uh, first thing he said is this has definitely come up before. Uh, two common use cases I've heard of are granting access in specific time windows or granting access if the request is coming from certain IP ranges. Uh, the close, and so the second item he said, the, the close kept I linked, I do think something like this is interesting for bounding requests to a specific node. And then another thought, uh, with the discussions happening around cell-based admission policies, would we ever consider something like a cell-based authorizer? If so, that would probably cover this use case. Uh, as an aside, uh, I, I don't think anyone has written up the doc or kept or anything, but I had spoken to some folks about the, the issue about um, being able to specify more than one webhook authorizer to the API server. And then also if it's big. Uh, one of the things, uh, uh, are you asking, Mike, are you asking what Stell is? Yeah. Uh, you know, common expression language. Uh, it's, 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 is being, uh, David, tell me, is it proposed or like more than proposed now for 
validation for CRD? Uh, it's actually implemented in alpha. They're going to do a second alpha this release, adding some more features to it. Yeah. Uh, it's used for validation of custom resources. Uh, I had not heard of anyone trying to do it um, for an authorizer. Uh, there is some, I won't say unbounded expense, but there is expense in uh, running an expression language on each request. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I had suggested to the folks that were working on or trying to start the work on um, the more than one webhook structured config thing that uh, since this was uh, being used elsewhere, it might be interesting to use there. I don't know if that went anywhere. Um, I would be interested to see if it would be possible to, instead of using cell as conditions in raw policy, use it to, to um, build a, a node graph that is extensible and supports stuff like CRDs. That would be really cool. And then we could just intersect that with RBAC and have like a node RBAC. I have no idea how that would work, but that's the sound cool. <laughs> um, yeah. Would that just be like a flag on an RBAC role that says like, intersect me, please? Yeah, or um, different object. I guess you could do either, but. Yeah. It seems like you could implement the node authorizer, re-implement it with something more generic if you could extract edges generically. Having a graph-based policy engine would be interesting. <laughs> uh, sounds awful to debug, but. Is there a concrete use case of, of that that uh, you don't get by just having name matching pods stuff bound to pods, but yes. like update a pod that is on the node that my daemon set runs on. Is that kind of the pod gets scheduled to node pod references CRD daemon set needs access to CRD. How does a pod reference CRD in the API annotation? Maybe you're talking like a node. A CRD that instantiates something that is node scoped? Yeah, I, I think what uh, Mike is trying to say is today, by the virtue of a pod referencing a secret and then being scheduled on a node, the node authorizer and admission plugins together allowed that, at that node at that time to access the secret so that it can mount it as a volume within the pods file system. I, I, Mike is saying, wouldn't it be great if instead of that being all hard coded into Kubernetes, uh, if there was a way to express this within the, the API and then, you know, as long as you have the right, you know, validation checks and authorization checks at the various places, you could then allow arbitrary extensions of this type. So I have a custom resource that can be referenced somehow by a pod and thus by that pod being scheduled on a particular node, the kubelet is allowed to uh, read that resource or whatever, uh, just not hard coded into the API server. Or perhaps a CSI driver. Yeah. So, I mean, that's certainly interesting and I think uh, valuable. Um, I was going to ask you, this is a high level, this, this whole condition idea uh, to me sounds more like a binding than a role. Right, like, yeah, I was going to comment on that. Why is it on a cluster role and not cluster role binding? Um, it was just prototype. That was just, that just threw me off. I was like, why, why does the cluster role decide who? I have the same complaint about resource name being in the role if we want to retread that path. Indeed. <laughs> oh, David's here. We were that was long before I was thank you. Yeah. Uh, well, I figured it would hold us for a while, and yeah, we made it seven years. Um, I, as, as a generic comment, I would be more interested, I think, in a separate object to express this than trying to reuse RBAC. The last time I reused RBAC uh, was for aggregated roles. 
Um, and in the end, people were not very happy with that decision. So, uh, could, could you could you give a little bit more detail, David? I mean, it, I, on that I mean, particular failure, uh, <laughs> sure. Um, so it required if people wanted to use it, they had to understand a new field on a type that they weren't expecting changes on. And that particular one ended up being um, self, not self mutating, but mutating. Well, yeah, self mutating, right? You describe what you want to aggregate and it almost became like a secondary spec and status. Um, and so people started getting modifications to, to resources they didn't expect, things they, um, there was some adjustment initially to the fact that different actors can change these things and they can express new fields. So I'd be careful of adding new things to it. I do suspect that we have people who are interpreting our RBAC resources today. Um, oh, they are, it's totally, it's totally, it's definitely. I mean, I'm not even saying anything about OpenShift. They're just, I've seen plenty of people use the RBAC data and it's yeah. expected to mean a thing and they use the standard go parsers and stuff so they'll just drop these new random condition fields and have no idea that the meaning of the RBAC is not yeah and the change and the change for the aggregated cluster roles didn't even have that problem uh because eventually it would settle to the final set but um yeah anyway uh separate would in my mind, be probably preferred if we pursued it. From the uh, chat, it sounds like Mark probably agrees with you. Oh, great. I, I what digging into that, like if you did that and you still wanted it to be role based, don't you just end up with a shadow policy system that you have to understand both of? It seems like, at least in the PR that I saw, the mechanics of these permissions are significantly different right i think well if you if you change the condition to be on the binding i think you still end up with a role based system where you're granting roles conditional on some stuff and so the whole like bindings indirect a principle to a role roles are reusable like that principle that still stays around and so i think you end up with the same semantics and if you call it our back v2 or if you call it you know cond our back like you just then end up with oh no i'm doing kubernetes with the conditional our back so this thing doesn't work on my system maybe not to maybe like go too far down like design and stuff i if if it came to that the new system was basically needing to reuse cluster role and having a different binding concept, uh, even that being a separate object, I think would be preferable because then it would be very clear that this new binding thing is conditional instead of always. And that would also prevent the whole, like you interpreted it wrong because there's no way you're randomly going to read a resource that you have no idea exists. And then, you know, we, we, we could at least still have that level of control if the idea of what permission you got was still just easily correctly expressed by a cluster role. I don't know if it is or not. Um, uh, That's a good point. If you, if you just made two new objects, a conditional role binding and a conditional cluster role binding, and you didn't change roles at all, then you don't have the problem of old or like interpreting authorizers, dropping conditions and granting access they shouldn't because there's just this new thing that they just don't know about yet. Yeah, and if they're written in any same way, they'll fail closed, right? And they'll be like, I don't, you don't have this permission because I don't see any role binding giving it to you. And they're like, well, yeah, because it's a conditional role binding or whatever. Um, but yeah. Um, oh, uh, but yeah, this is interesting. Um, uh, Mike, if you want to continue discussion next time. I think that'd be Yeah, great. no, th this is really helpful. I think I, I, I had some thoughts around this I, and I just kind of wanted to, I, I've been around for a while, but I just wanted to hear what 
other folks thought and, and what other folks were thinking about direction on this. So, so it sounds like you're a, a secondary type, a cluster, like a, a conditional cluster role and condition or set of types, role, role binding, cluster role, cluster role bindings. Um, with the same, almost the same set of types, but with these conditions. So that there's not confusion about where could this, does my cluster, does my cluster role binding and or cube support conditions or not and failing closed. That seems like a simpler place to start, like an easy yeah. pitch. Uh, it's not a promise that like, yeah, do this and no. you're done. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I get it. Uh, I think the other things that came up were how would you handle create? And mm -hmm. do your use cases require touching shared objects? Uh, and if so, do you want to find a way to restrict what, what is actually modified inside of there? Yeah, so I could imagine, I could imagine a whatever policy object thing that is implemented not just as an authorizer, but as an authorizer and admission plug and pair. Uh, so you could, you know, I could imagine it saying that um, you, you know, Mo can update this object, but he can only set this field. Okay. Um, and I think that's where stuff like cell is more yeah. interesting. It's much easier to express a set of criteria because it's, a, I mean, it's not as expressive as like Python, but it's expressive enough. And maybe it is good that it's less expressive than Python, so you don't try to write an entire massive policy engine into your definitions. Right. Uh, and so is that cell? I didn't totally catch this. Is that like an? It's an, it's a cap, but is that for CRD validation or is that also for like authorization? It's for custom resource validation. The actual CEL engine itself, though, if you set it up with these are like your, uh, I forget what they call it, but like the starting node, uh, you can reference and pull names out of them, for instance. And then there's a set of the library of functions for things like comparisons. I think, can you hear me now? Yes. Good, uh, switched over to Windows. Um, <laughs> uh, the, um, yeah, so the approved cap, um, and the thing that's implemented in alpha is for CRD validation. But um, I think it was called out in that cap as a possible future extension to add um, uh, kind of validating and even mutating admission control based on that. Um, I think there might be a draft cap shared out in a Google doc. Um, I can see if I can find that afterwards and send it your way. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I'm re relatively like positive on this stuff just because I, I find it the it is a hard sell to say that hey, if you want to validate this field to like be within like this I don't know, starts with X, go write an entire webhook to do that instead of like two lines of cell or actually I think it's one line of cell so. Um, or at least the simple stuff, it's, it makes a lot more sense to just encode it within the CRD channel. Oh, all right. Uh, let's see. Got it. Thanks. Yeah, thanks for the discussion, y'all. We got 15 minutes left. I guess we can quickly. Um, can I just say one more thing on this topic for me? Okay. Um, I think it would be helpful to collect a list of use cases for this, um, because right now it sounds like the strongest use case we have is node scoped authorization. Um, and if that's really the like primary use case for this, it might be worth considering open reopening something like that, uh, that node scoped. Um, I can't remember exactly what was proposed there, but like something that could potentially take advantage of the, uh, the graph that's already built out by the node authorizer instead. Tim, did you uh, hear my comment earlier or were you around? Uh, 
that might have been in the transition. Uh, we, was this about using cell to access the? the yeah, yeah, I want to hear what did you think about that. Um, yeah, I think that's interesting. I mean, I think if we're talking about full fledged cell based authorization, then that would definitely subsume this use case. Um, what do you mean by that? Uh, I mean, if we could, like, if there was something where you say, like, write a cell expression to grant authorization, um, or were you saying something more narrowly scoped than that? I was saying, like, some, so you know, like, we, the current mechanism is you, a pod is created mm -hmm. and the node authorizer, we pull out the secrets. And we create edges to those secrets from the pod for to see. Mm -hmm. um, and then when we query that, we say this secret has a graph. There's you can trace a path to the node. So instead of hard coding how we extract the edges to the node, we could allow uh, that extraction to be. Uh, Program dynamically using cell, so you could still query the node graph, but it could you could query it for something like a CRD mm -hmm. instead of a secret. Is that what you were thinking, or were you thinking? Uh, is that how you interpreted what I said? Um, it, so I think you're talking about how the graph gets constructed. I I guess I was interpreting it more from the other direction of how do like once you have that graph, then how do you Access intersect that. it with RBAC, like check an RBAC permission, not RBAC, maybe it's called uh, like a node scoped role binding. Mm -hmm. Intersect, like intersect it with permissions yeah. granted that are node scoped. Um, I'll let you mull over that, we can discuss it next week. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, I totally agree. We should um, re. Uh, uh, we should revisit that old cap and see if there was anything that our smarter three years younger selves thought of. Really quick question on that. Is like a, is that part of, would that be still part of the RBAC API or are we talking about a new API? Uh, so I, like CJ said that this could be a bull flag on uh, role binding that is just like node scoped. Um, uh, David okay. said that we shouldn't uh, willy nilly add weird things that change the semantics of our back. Mike, are you using Linux too? Did we just lose you? <laughs> yeah, I think, it, I think it could be either. I'm just trying to think of what's the user going to, how does, how does the user interacting with the API reason about what permissions a thing has? Um, but yeah. so. Like how do, how do they define and reason about that? Like, do they say, here's my YAML, I'm going to apply it. Like, just like they do RBAC, this is just another API like that that we're talking about. Node authorizer isn't, doesn't have an API. Yeah, service. I guess it would be a, uh, so there would be a, like, there would need to be a new API introduced to uh, okay. to configure that, and it would like take as input like your conditions, but the conditions would be used. There maybe wouldn't even be a condition at that point. It would take in cell like the validation APIs do, yeah. and the cell would output edges and vertices, um, and that's what the node authorizer would run to maintain the graph. I guess it wouldn't even need to be the node authorizer. Yeah. Um, you could, you could re-implement parts of the node authorizer with that. Uh, probably all of it. Yeah. And then, yeah. Still have node admission for some things, but yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah. So a whole different API group, because you need to cover escalate cases and 
whatnot um, in in the API, right? Um, yes, maybe. I haven't even thought that far. Yeah. Uh, I'm just going to echo some stuff on chat. I see Max has said that. Um, if there, uh, there's Mark. Mark said that, you know, if there's intent to add something like cell, why make, you know, operators learn more stuff? Like, they'll make two different, I guess, schemas for specifying policy. Sure. Good. Seems good. Good thing, I guess. Uh, the only reason I can truly see against cell is if it's just too expensive to run all the time, or if it's um, too expressive, basically, like you don't actually want to hand that level of control. I don't know. I don't know if those are actual concerns, but just. I'm you know. more worried. Sorry, I'm more worried about the second one that um, it, that adds a lot of complexity. And I think this was the argument that we've had against conditions in the past that it makes it too hard to understand who has access to what. One feature of RBAC that is nice is that it's invertible. So you can look and say, does this, uh, does this subject have access to make this particular kind of request? You can also look, and if you have all of our back present, you can say, what actions can this person take? Yeah. Couldn't you still answer that with a conditional? I mean, you, you can basically say they can there, take this it, action if this on, evaluates to true. If it's based on time, I think that's really hard to do. Um, like, you know, from 12 to 12 5, you can do this. From 12 5 to 7 p.m., you can do that. Um, I think that makes it harder. Uh, but like first approximation, your output, instead of being a Boolean, could be a condition that you have to like stare at. I, I guess I, I'm, I'm a little less uh, happy about the idea of even trying to pursue temporal stuff because like as a, for example, if, if I can t t right now temporarily do a thing, I can, like, and let's just say I have like admin level access temporarily to a namespace, right? I can at that instant create a service account, granted admin access to that namespace, grab the token for the service account, and now I'm no longer bound by the temporal thing because I just pushed my access elsewhere. And so like, it's less clear, like you, you would have to make sure that like any sort of like links of the temporality keep being scoped. I'm not really sure if that's reasonable or feasible. Like, I agree, I could, but like European customers don't. No, no, I, I understand that this comes as a request that like, I just want my, uh, my employees to only be doing things during like work hours. And it's like, okay, but like, it's gonna be best effort. Like it's not actually a security thing. It's mostly just like preventing accidents, not really preventing a bad actor from being bad. Yeah, you, you don't even need like custom authenticators for that. I mean, that there there are entire engines that will do this sort of temporal, you know, provision the user into a group when they're authorized, deprovision them when they're done. I mean, it's the entire privileged access model system that most enterprises end up having. Um, I, I don't know that. I don't even know that that to most point that it's even a problem that could be effectively solved from inside of. Kubernetes. Yeah. I mean, if you had a simplistic system that was just adding and removing you from groups that gave you permissions and our back was just bound to those, well, nothing prevents you from abusing the rights at the time that you had them and pushing them into a different actor, right? Because our back itself has no concept of time. It's just in the sense of other than the now, if you are allowed to do this thing now, and you know that happens to be get uh, it happens to be run during an RBAC escalation check. Well, then in a sense you can do it infinitely because you be granted to someone else. Yeah, and for that specific case, I'm not even sure if allow conditions make a whole lot of sense. Maybe if they're the only things available, but that really seems like something that should be expressed with some sort of deny policy. Um, otherwise, every single role binding 
has to have okay, this condition um, versus you know a single policy that says nine to five. Yeah. Um, yeah, I was just wondering about uh, how uh, this would work with um, anything that does caching of authorization as well. Um, and also subject to access reviews would need to be accounted for as well. Yeah, uh, yeah. sort of no matter what, you know, whatever metadata you're gonna make available to the RBAC authorizer has to be expressible through the authorization attributes, which then sort of funnel into subject access review. Um, so certainly any of the admission stuff is already available, right? Uh, to any admission webhook, as long as it's basically in the user info somewhere. Or, I mean, admission can have basically everything. Uh, so it's really the subject access review bit. Uh, but I neither token review or subject access review in their response include anything about a temporal thing, right? Like you, you can't say from a token review that, hey, this user, I mean, this token means this user for the next two minutes because that's how like long the token is valid for. It's like the cache is just arbitrarily fixed for both layers and it's kind of not great. So let's see if you want. Yeah, like a quick knee jerk response to that is you could just return a condition. You could extend the subject access review uh, status to include a condition or you could just say no for anything that has a condition that you can't know. Um, the condition kind of pushes off the burden to say, hey, if you know how to evaluate and you want to know, like, if this is a temporal thing or if this is a request characteristic thing, like, there's your answer. I also had a question for Mike about if we did the node graph in cell thing, could you then just write cell in a more general uh, conditional binding to access the node graph and like just have all of the node authorizer stuff be conditional bindings? All right, I, um, I'm sure that you can. <laughs> Uh, I don't it would just be like terrible and gross. And is, do we I, get back I, to the cell is hard because you can't tell who has access? Where if we just say node scoped, it's clear what the intent was. Um, node I, authorizer I express. Yeah. Node authorizer does a lot of caching, um, and there's like multiple layers of indirection there that I think to do that on the fly would be really expensive. Yeah, for sure. I think we would still do the caching. It would be like you're getting a uh, the the attributes you're allowed to access are you know guaranteed to be no more than three minutes out of date or whatever. Um, but like you're not necessarily that's probably too long. But it would probably be the same caveats as the node authorizer. But it would just be like you'd be presenting the node graph to be queryable. Right? Is that what you're talking about, Mike? Um, or am I yeah. putting words in there? It, it would be the same. So, uh, the, I, I'm, so the indexes that we build today, we could build, we could continue to build. Yeah. Um, so it, the, the graph access could still be cached like it is today. But I think it's more for like, especially for things that are doing delegated authorization. Um, yeah, I think we're talking about maybe two different, we're flipping between subjects, which might make this conversation confusing. You're talking about being able to add a CRD to the node graph. Right, which is separate. Yeah. And the, the node caching, to, because that's a very busy authorizer. And then now we're also talking about how to cache uh, conditions uh, conditional grants when we're doing a subject access review, which is a separate question. Or maybe I didn't follow the relationship between what you- I think the caching and subject access review questions are also different because caching is just like, all right, if we evaluated a condition and it answered true five minutes ago, is that okay for us to just 
assume still holds or do we need to be smarter about what the conditions are and like never cache a temporal condition or a IP address, I guess, I don't know. We'd have to add more things to the cache key for, yeah. Well, I think uh, we are out of time. It's been a really good discussion. Uh, we're good at on the fly discussions, Michael, apparently. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, yeah, let's let's continue this next time. I think I think there's a lot of interest. Uh, and, you know, uh, yeah, I, I suspect that when there's lots of interest, I think folks can get something done here. Uh, so let's let's keep talking. Uh, but yeah, we'll see everyone next week or not next week, two weeks from now. Yeah. Thank you.